Hi everybody, my name is Warren. I'm the captain of a boat called Motiart Dopamine. Yachting is my passion. YBI crew. <laughs> I like charter boats because we have different guests coming on board. We go to different places. You have different people and personalities. There's also a much higher energy level on the boat because we have to produce every day. You can't get complacent with the owners. You can't take your foot off the gas and you're always there to impress. You know, these charter guests are spending crazy amounts of money to come on board and they want the best. And that's what we try to give them. So you get paid more money for it you have better itineraries, you have more interaction with people, um, and you, can, you get to show off your skills. First of all, I think it depends on where in the world you are. If you're coming to the Mediterranean, guests are looking to be at cocktail parties and invite their friends over, they wanna to go to Cannes and Monaco, they want to go to Saint-Tropez, it's all about being seen. Guests in the Caribbean are a little bit more um, sports orientated, they like beach setups, they like water sports, diving, fishing, definitely more my kind of uh, uh, scene. But of course we're on dual season boats, so you're either in the Med or you're in the Caribbean. You know, it depends on the age group as well. If you've got a bunch of 30 year old crypto geniuses, then they're all about drinking tequila from lunchtime and having parties and throwing themselves off the top of the boat. And then you have, you know, elder people and they wake up late and they go to bed early. I mean, there's a really huge array of reasons why a guest could be on a super yacht. After all, it's the ultimate escape. So the preference sheets tell us where you want to go, where you want to eat, what you like to drink, what you like, what time you want to eat, what kind of fruits do you want. It also gives us an idea of the activities you want to do. And then we also reference check a lot of the guests with other boats. So captains will speak to each other and find out what the guests were like on the last boat, what it'll think the idiosyncrasies that they want us to remember that would help us to make it a smoother um, experience for the guests. So tomorrow we're going out, which was which is three days before the charter, and we're taking out all the water sports gear. We're pumping up the tubes and the trampolines and we're charging the sea bobs and the e-foils and we're launching the tenders and we're getting the whole operation so everyone is, is confident and looks smooth and looks professional when they're doing it. There's nothing worse than arriving at a place and the guests all crowd around the back of the boat, which they do as soon as you get somewhere and you're running around trying to get everything organized and the passerelle out and the lines are all over the place. So yeah, a lot of practice. Yeah, so I consider myself fortunate and un unfortunate. <clears throat> About 10 years ago, um, myself and my dad and uh, my, my girlfriend at the time, we crashed in a helicopter and um, I think everything changed that day. Our lives were turned upside down. Um, I broke my, my leg and my back and my hips and a whole bunch of other bones and the same for my dad and my, my girlfriend at the time. So that took me out of the industry for a long time. You know, I, I didn't walk for pretty much seven months. Um, and then when I could walk again, I realized that I wasn't strong enough to work on the boats because you need to be able-bodied, you need to be energetic. So I went back to university and I did a, an M a MBA, a master's in business administration. It was always my plan to do it because my dad had done it <clears throat> and following in, in his footsteps was always part of my life. So when I completed the MBA, I went into the uh, corporate world and I worked in various different uh, divisions in a company and it was really good. I enjoyed it. But um, after three years, it was three years and one day I walked into the CEO's office and I had a big smile on my face and I handed him my resignation and he said <clears throat> he was waiting for me to do that. He could see that this wasn't uh, wasn't going to be me forever, so I was very luck very lucky. You know, um, I went to the MCA, and luckily I was working in, in the shipping division, so they uh, gave me my my licenses or revalidated everything, and I came back and I joined the industry again, uh, and I had a, a second wind. I was very excited and very happy to be doing what I loved again. So. I then um, got the last bit of sea, sea time I needed for my Master 3000, which is your captain's ticket. And it was a few years ago now that I passed that oral exam. And uh, I think I've never looked back since. I'm right there in amongst everyone. 
I very rarely ask someone to do something that I won't do myself or if I haven't done already. You need to encourage the crew. You need to show the crew what they might be doing right or wrong. There's never one correct way to do something on a boat. And I would prefer not to ever lead in that style and be like, this is the only way you should do it. It's best to let them make those mistakes if you can and then show them, show them a correct way to do it. And if they show you a better way to do it, even better. Uh, I've had a couple of authoritative captains in the past and I was always scared to make mistakes and scared to ask a question. And that's definitely not the style that I would like to run a boat by. You know, I like an interactive crew. I want the crew to come and talk to me if something's wrong. In order for crew to do a good job, they need to have sufficient rest. So we use different apps uh, or different systems that we can monitor their rest. You know, it's very easy for the crew just to work on and on and on, and you will see productivity go down very quickly. So it's important that the heads of department and the captain monitor their crew's work and rest periods. So yeah, there is definitely a trend for expedition boats at the moment, and that's also because owners, experienced owners, want to go beyond. They want to go further. They want to go to new places. Most of us who've been working in the industry have been doing the med, for example, every year for 15 or 20 years. So there's only so many places you can go to. For example, my owner considers a lot of the places here like gelato stops. You stop at one town, you pick up your gelato, you buy a porcelain mug and you move off to the next place. And he's quite an adventurous guy, our, our guy. He really wants to get out there. He wants to go spear fishing and diving. So for owners like that, they are looking to go further. We can do the med for a couple of years in a row, but then you wanna to go to the Pacific or you wanna to go to Greenland or you wanna to go to Alaska or you wanna to go to the Indian Ocean, you know, Maldives, Comores, Seychelles, Mauritius, Madagascar. These are amazing places to go to. But that said, don't forget more and more people are buying boats right now. So there's not less boats coming to the med. In fact, this is the busiest med season that, that I can remember in history. Just to try and get a berth in a, in a port <clears throat> or a marina is extremely difficult. You know, when we started, we barely used yacht agents. Now yacht agencies are, are, are huge businesses. They have the relationships with, with all the marinas and the ports, and they're the ones that can try and get us a, a berth and a location. Because if I try, you know, just off the bat, there's a good chance that I'll be, I'll be denied. So yes, there's more room for expedition and, and to go further, but I think the Med's always gonna be busy. By far, my favorite spots in the world to take the guests are the French Polynesian Islands. You can just imagine, it's deep oceans, so you've got four or five kilometers of sea. And then um, an atoll is basically an old volcano that used to come out of the water, but it was weathered down over the years. So you've got this ring of land, which is only 100 meters wide, covered by coconut trees and palm trees. And then inside with the crater part, it's just coral and fish. And then this beautiful little land spiring out from the inside. And everything outside of that is just blue water. As far as I can see, it is just absolutely out of this world. So favorite water sports toys, I would say for me are the foil boards, kite surfing foils, although they're harder to use than uh, normal kite surfing boards. Electric foils are a lot of fun when you get the hang of them, but they're not always the best for guests because guests are not always water sports orientated and there is a risk of injury there. So we do a little bit of training sessions and things like that and we have to keep a much closer eye on them. There is a new jet ski that came out. It's a 300 horsepower sea dew It was frighteningly fast. I've never seen anything so fast like that on the water in my life. I ride motorbikes and that thing would kick my motorbike's butt on a straight race. So I guess they're just making things faster. You know, they didn't really come up with any new toys that we hadn't seen. They had one interesting one. It was like shaped like a U that someone had a remote control and they throw it in the water and you could remote control this little device to someone swimming in the water. They can hold on to it and then you can bring them back to the boat. So, I mean, I guess if the guests are lazy, they can ask you to swim them around and you can just press the button and take them around the boat a couple of times. Thanks Ulrika for introducing me to YPI crew. You guys are amazing. Lydia, you've been a star. Thank you very much. And I'm very happy to share our experiences with you. Day four of interview, proof of life. <laughs> Keeping the hostage exactly. It's exhausting stuff. I'm parched. We demand $15 million for my imminent release. 
and Mark Bills. YPI crew.